So I'm, I'm Kerry Patterson, the Project Officer for Digitising Edwin Morgan Scrapbooks Project. So this is a joint venture between today's organisers, CREATE, and the special collections in the Glasgow University Library. So this project centres around a set of scrapbooks created by Edwin Morgan, the poet, between the 1930s and the 1960s. So Morgan was born in Glasgow in 1920, uh, known internationally as a poet and a translator. He was also a professor at Glasgow University. In his teens, he was very interested in pursuing a career in art and design, though he later decided on a literary route. So the scrapbooks are actually really important um, as an early creative outlet, and that continued until he was in his 40s. So Morgan had a great desire to have his scrapbooks published, and this began in the 1950s, before he'd even finished completing the 16 volumes of scrapbooks that now exist. He wanted them published, and he, had a, he really put a great value on them. This quote is from a letter that he sent to his uh, literary agent in 1953, and the agent had been inquiring if Morgan had any longer works um, on a larger scale suitable for publication. So Morgan wrote this a quite a long letter, gently proposing that um, these scrapbooks could be published. So what happened after this was nothing. No reply recorded, they didn't take him up on his offer, and he continued his careers teaching, writing, and he continued making the scrapbooks. Um, for about another decade. So what, what are the scrapbooks? This is an example of a page from scrapbook 12. So it does look like you would expect a, a scrapbook to look, um, but it goes beyond that. It's very highly and specifically organized. It reflects um, his interests and his life. Um, this double page has got 61 individual cuttings. So these are from a range of different types of material. A lot of it's contemporary with the production or the creation of the books in, so this was made 1954 to around 1960. Um, the cuttings could be very small, it could be an individual word from an article, it could be a really tiny um, image or a corner of an image, and they're all um, put together and shaped and layered, and he completely fills uh, the pages of the books with hardly, if you can't find an image, he'll put a little kind of squiggle or a doodle in the corner. So it's quite an obsessive, um, thorough uh, way that in which he created these books. So the project is, um, oh sorry, my, the bottom of my uh, slide's gone off there. Let's see if I can... Uh, Sorry about that. Okay, so the project is uh, looking at how EU and UK copyright policy impact uh, the digitisation of the collections like the scrapbooks. So looking at what the costs are in clearing rights and um, how onerous the, the current requirements of diligent search are. So essentially it's really about how can we legally digitise this set of scrapbooks and other works like the scrapbooks. So moving forward from Morgan's first efforts in 1953, 35 years on to 1988. So this is a quote from a letter that Morgan wrote to his publisher, Michael Schmidt at Carcanet in 1988. So in which he's trying to pique his publisher's interest in um, publishing the books. So Morgan was by now a retired professor, established poet and a translator, and he had a long standing relationship with his publisher. The scrapbooks, actually, he didn't have them in his possession anymore because he gave them to special collections in 1980. But even in spite of that, he was still so determined to achieve publication. So, and I think this is really what the project is about, along with the academic outputs. It's about trying to do this thing that Morgan had been trying to achieve since 1953, which was publishing the scrapbooks. So this was the reply from his publisher, which is interested but cautious. And again, unfortunately, in this time, 1988, nothing came of it. You know, the, the publisher didn't take him up on the offer, so the scrapbooks remained unpublished. The note that he says looks particularly expensive there, which is certainly something that we've continued to discover. So a first step was made, April uh, 2010. A Flickr set of 15 images was made available to celebrate Morgan's 90th birthday. So this was made available by uh, University of Glasgow Library. And Morgan's biographer, James McGonagall, supplied commentaries um, on the pages. 
These pages were uh, made available on a risk managed basis, so choosing pages which had quite abstracted images, ephemera and Morgan's own artwork. So this risk managed approach is really used quite widely by many institutions, but obviously some organisations are more risk averse than others. But how can we make the scrapbooks available in a more widespread way? So the main barriers for that would be the costs of colour reproduction and copyright costs. In 2016, um, reproduction costs, because we were able to uh, reproduce material online, those need not necessarily be an issue. But uh, the cost of right, rights clearance um, and those associated costs still remain. The crux, the crux of the issue with the scrapbook is really the vast number of creators and the vast number of works which are uncredited. <laughs> okay. Right, uh, so just some figures about the scrapbooks. Over 16 volumes, there's 3,600 pages. There's an estimated 54,000 individual items and an estimated 72% of orphan works. So again, apologies that my slides have gone slightly ski with. So there are two aspects to look at in terms of digitisation. Rights clearance for works that have known copyright holders and also diligent search uh, for works without co uh, known copyright holders. These are the orphan works. So the definition of an orphan work is any work which is still in copyright but the, right holder, the rights holders are not known or can't be found following a diligent search. So I'm going to focus today on diligent search under the UK orphan works licensing scheme. So with the orphan works, the type of works in the scrapbook, what kind of diligent search can actually be performed? What is really difficult is that so much of the material is decontextualized and there is so much of it. So there are, as you can have seen from the earlier image, a lot of the material um, is images and these are kind of cut out from the original source without any note of um, where they uh, came from. So my initial, my initial uh, diligent searches were carried out um, for these images and I used um, kind of image search engines such as Google Image Search. So this allows you to upload an image um, and search for it that way. And this is, um, so the IPO's diligent search guidelines uh, recognize this uh, type of diligent search. They include um, a couple of search engines which are uh, TinEye and PicScout as ways of looking for your images. So I did a little bit of work with these Google, TinEye and PicScout and I really found that Google had the greatest chance um, of success because they actually have access to the most images. Another source um, suggested by the IPO is uh, BAPLA, which is the British Association of Picture Libraries and, and Agencies. They actually have an Orphan Works uh, search request form on their website. So you can go in and put, out, put your details in and they will, this goes off to a number of picture libraries who can then get back to you if they're able to match up um, your query, query with anything held by their members. So I actually um, experimented with using some of these image search tools for my brochure essay um, that accompanies the exhibition. So if you want to read a little bit more about that, you can read it in there. So what I found really helpful for the scrapbooks about these um, image search engines was that they can help identify partial images. So we'll see, you might be able to see at the top left of the scrapbook page here, there's um, a photograph of a child. So this has been cut from a larger image. So when I ran this through Google, I found out that it came from the cover of this uh, magazine, a French magazine, again from uh, around the 1950s. So this was a kind of, this was great. It kind of confirmed my suspicions that it was probably in copyright, it was by a significant photographer, professional. Um, and then I passed this uh, magazine cover image on to the BAPLA picture agency, but unfortunately uh, nobody was able to identify it there. So we did get a partial result, but I think it just shows that even really identifying some images or making that first step doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to go forward and complete your, your rights clearance. But also another thing to think about is the image that was used in the scrapbook It is a partial image. So even if we were able to get in contact with the photographer, would they be concerned about this small portion of their image being used in this way? And possibly not. Other um, contact I've had with um, some photographers as individuals and in their estates have shown that they're actually uh, 
quite happy for images to be used in this project, though that's uh, certainly not universally the case, but it, it can really depend on the individual. So this brings me on to the element of luck in versus diligent search. So this is a, uh, an image, black and white portrait image of a boy, which comes from the scrapbook. So again, this sets up a bit of a red flag for me, professionally taking a photograph. It's from a glossy magazine, but there's absolutely no context uh, with it at all. So I did some Im image searches, didn't uh, have any luck, but then by sheer chance, um, managed to find on Twitter that somebody was using the same image as their avatar. So got, got in touch with them and found out that they had taken it from a book and it had originally come from a magazine from the 1950s. So after a, um, it's a, a French photographer called uh, Bernard uh, Poinceau. So I was able to get in touch with his son after some uh, emails in French using Google Translate and the help of a colleague. <laughs> Um, and he, after some back and forth about he was not sure if it actually was by his father, so once we'd sorted that out and he um, agreed that it was, he um, agreed that we could use it for free in the book, but we have to put a disclaimer, because even though he was not kind of happy with how it appeared in the book, that it didn't represent his father's work very well, he was still quite happy to use it for free. So. This was really an example of just sheer chance because I hadn't been able to find this out using any of the normal diligent search sources. You know, if I'd had access to a bunch of contemporary photography magazines, I might have found it, but that would really be going beyond what would be the reasonable bounds of diligent search. So I have made an Orphan Works um, application to the Orphan Works licensing scheme. So I picked five works uh, from the scrapbook, a poem, an original photographic work, magazine cutting, and two cartoons. So these are the, um, the times that, I've, uh, that were taken for the works. So the longest time, um, which is just over three and a half hours, is for a magazine that appears frequently um, in the scrapbooks. But um, even though it is named, ownership of the publication is quite unclear. Um, so you see that the time varies. So the shortest time spent was 35 minutes on this black and white photograph, and the longest time was three hours, 35, and that includes diligent search and also um, completing the licensing application. Um, so for the 35 minute search, so again, this is a completely decontextualized photographic image. So I, before submitting the application, I just did diligent search through three the three um, image search tools, Google Images, Tenai and PicScout, and submitted it under that, um, a, a, with, that, with that as my only form of diligent search because there was no other um, information available. So the IPO came back and they recommended that I search BAPLA and contact two other photographic agencies. And once I'd done that, um, they were, and had no result, they were satisfied that that could be considered uh, as an orphan work. So the amount of time to spend in search really varies quite dramatically. And what it says about the definition of diligence and that the IPO regard it as very much dependent on the work. And I, I, I kind of felt that it, it might even be very much less than an archivist might normally consider to be necessary, such as in the case of the photograph. It seems like quite a short time, but there really are no, with such decontextualized work, there are no other sources. Looking at the time and cost, um, so if 72% of the 54,000 items are orphan works, it would take one person nearly 12 years to clear rights just for those items. And a baseline figure for that is £288,430. So obviously this is a, a significant amount of money and time, and this is also just for the orphan works. So this doesn't include the costs of works in copyright, which may or may not incur a cost, but would certainly at least take time, which is arguably the most significant factor. So returning back to Edwin Morgan, where are we now? So it's actually nearly, from his original letter that he wrote, 7th of June 1953, it's nearly 63 years to the day from his first approach to a publisher, when are the books to be published? So what, we, um, what we're in the process of working on is creating a digital edition of part of the scrapbooks. So it's actually 10% of scrapbook 12, which is only a 30-page sample. So this is going to be embedded in a web resource that includes information on copyright and 
you know, for organisations who wish to work with similar materials, um, using, like, for example, newspaper cuttings or photographs, and providing um, kind of briefing notes and information notes to inform people about the relevant laws that they need to consider and um, what kind of uh, risks that they may be incurring. So this is um, an example of a double page view. So this is filtered. Um, so you, we have set it up in one way so you can filter it. You can see all of the, um, the pages as they are. Or you can also filter it according to your risk appetite. So if you have a low appetite for risk, this is what you can see um, of the pages. So what you can do, all you can see here is really, um, this hides all the medium and high risk items. All that's left are things which are out of copyright or made by Edwin Morgan or things which are really so abstracted from their original source that they, are, they don't meet the definition of substantiality under copyright law. So not really uh, very much to look at. This is if you are looking at the scrapbooks under a medium risk filter. So this is just taking out the really high risk um, red flag items. So you can, see, you can see a lot of what's there, but really the, you know, Morgan's own vision of how he wanted this, the scrapbooks to be, you still can't see everything. They were kind of a, an overall work and to, to blank the things out in these way means that you can't see the work as Morgan would have originally intended. So the site will also have um, each individual cutting. You can click on it to see information. So apologies, it's not very clear here, but you'll be able to um, look at the information about where it came from, um, some of the uh, risk um, judgments that have been made, and also if there's any credit lines or the idea is that we're going to make everything available to see. And so if people have asked us for um, costs or have waived costs, then that information will also uh, be included. So this is going to be displayed with um, a very thorough disclaimer. <laughs> so, um, you know, to cover, and it's really, it is part of a, it's part of a research project and it's really partly under those auspices that we're, we're able to uh, make it available in this way. So some conclusions, um, how diligent is diligent? It's dependent on the item and this is recognised by the IPO and also reflected in the Orphan Works licensing scheme to the effect that the bar is set much lower for items without uh, context, uh, though the application procedure takes just the same amount of time. So the requirements for, of the IPO for diligent search may also be much lower than you may expect and maybe even your kind of own instincts as an archivist. If you work for an organisation that's quite risk averse, um, this, you know, it may not actually be the same as what you would expect. But um, the monetary and the time costs are still enormous for a mass digitisation project such as this. So as I mentioned, making the part of the scrapbooks available is under the auspices of this research project and the fact that web visitors will be able to see everything, even items which um, we would potentially have to pay money to use. And this is obviously not an approach that institutions would be willing to take um, themselves. So we've, as I said, we've drafted this very thorough disclaimer with the input of a number of experts in archives and copyright law. But again, this is not help that most organisations have access to. And digitising the scrapbooks is certainly not an act that um, it, the cultural heritage institution would take lightly. So even with a high appetite um, of risk in terms of diligent search, you know, digitising these large numbers of items with right, where the rights holders are known um, will also be costly. So in 2016, physical reproduction costs don't have to be a cost issue, but rights clearance very much remains an issue. And for me, uh, time is the crucial thing here. Morgan spent uh, 30 years working on the scrapbooks and it could really take half of that time again to clear the rights uh, for the thousands of individual tiny items. So I'll just end by reflecting on a quote from Edwin Morgan, so describing the dual nature of being a copyright producer and a copyright consumer as copyright good versus copyright bad. And even though we're still striving to attain this publication that he desired, I know that he would certainly sympathise with our struggle. Thank you.